It's not it a part of what? The main trap. So anything that's on the outside or the periphery of that, or an attachment to that, is what they're referring to as access, accessory, right? So mouth, oral cavity going down, continues to become esophagus, which becomes small and large intestines, so liver would be the correct answer there, right? Okay, skin is an example of which of the following barriers? Woo, everybody got this right, yes. <laughs> now if you see the term mechanical, that would mean the same thing, right? Physical or mechanical means the same thing. So if you see mechanical on the test, please do not throw a fit, okay? It means the same thing. Okay, so I don't even have to uh, explain that one. Mental, duh, like I just was looking for options and threw that in there. Okay. Which of the following secondary lymphoid organs filters blood? Which one? Spleen. Okay. What is lymph node filter? Lymph, right? Name suggests. Malt is not filtering anything. Malt is actually along your tracks, right? And bone marrow, is that even an option? No, because it's not a secondary lymphoid organ, it's a primary lymphoid organ. Okay, four. Which of the following functions does a cytotoxic T cell perform? We just talked about this, right? So, does it perform opsonization? What is opsonization? Coding foreign pathogens, right? What coats foreign pathogens? What contributes to opsonization? Do you remember? Complement. In case yeah, you're wondering. Right. Complement proteins. Right? Mm. Remember we say that complement proteins, yeah, that part they is. have three major functions. Opsonization is one. What's another one? Mac attack. Mac attack, yes, big Mac. You should remember that, right? And then, what else? Inflammation, those are the three major uh, uh, effector functions of complement proteins, right? And they have the three pathways right. to accomplish that. By the way, you guys bombed that uh, complement pathway question on the quiz, which means it's most likely gonna come back, right? Yeah, what happened there? Right, remember, that was on the quiz, it's not here, it's on the quiz. I was gonna bring it, but I was like, nah, save it for the test, right? So complement proteins, if you remember, there are three major pathways, right? Alternative, classical, and lectin. lectin. Very good. So you have to think about how those three pathways are initiated, right? So what initiates lectin pathway? Binding to what? Sugars, right? Anos binding lectins, right? Um, what about classical pathway? <coughs> antibody complexes. Just anytime you hear antibody, you should be thinking classical. Anytime you see that word, that term, that phrase. Okay, what about alternative pathway? Hmm? Water is mediated by hydrolysis of water, right? So anytime you see water anywhere in there, that's alternative, because you don't need anything else. It's binding to the pathogen surface, and it's mediated by, by water, hydrolysis of water. Okay, so we rule out opsonization. Uh, do cytotoxic T cells make antibodies? No. Check, mark. In other words, you remove it, you eliminate it from your answer set, right? And then, so whenever you come across a question where you're not sure what the answer is, you probably should use process of elimination. Look at all the terms that you're familiar with and say, okay, is this cell associated with this? Cross it out. And then whichever one remains, <laughs> that's probably your best guess. If you don't know the answer, this is how I'd recommend that you go about that question. Anyway, kills bacteria. So well, it's either one of the last two, right? So either going to specialize in killing bacteria or specialize in killing virus infected cells. And what did we say cytotoxic T cells do? Who, which cell specializes in clearing bacteria? B cells, B -cells. right? Because they take care of extracellular pathogens. Cytotoxic T cells, they're involved in clearing 
intracellular pathogen. So if a cell is infected at that point, that pathogen is inside the cell. So cytotoxic T cell is gonna to try to kill that entire infected cell because it doesn't want the other cells to become infected, right, by that virus. So that's the correct answer. Okay, a patient contracted a bacterial infection and went to see his physician to get antibi antibiotics to aid in his treatment. Which of the following MHC immune cell pair was most likely involved in the immune response to clear the pathogen? When I say involved, I mean at the beginning, before it got to the antibiotic stage. Because you'll go for antibiotics only after your immune system can no longer clear the foreign pathogen, right? At that point, you need help. And that's why Dr. Boyle will come and talk about antibiotics after we're done with the immunology section of this course. Because ideally what we're showing you is that your immune system has the ability to clear pathogens, but if it cannot, you need to go get help from the physician and from you guys, pharmacists, who will select the best antibiotics for that patient, right? Um, so uh, the idea is during the patient's immune response to that foreign pathogen, which pair would be used? Which MHC and which cell? Anybody know? Yes. So the correct answer is yes. MHC two, class two CD4. and CD4 positive T cell. We actually just talked about it. Mm -hmm. I was like, hmm, let me just throw it in there and see if you guys will remember, right? Because this is part of Dr. Hughes's lecture, right? Remember what she's gonna talk, what she talked about was what is the pathogen, what is the class of pathogen that's being cleared, which MHC is being used, which T cell is being used, okay, and which pathway is used to process it. Is it exogenous or endogenous pathway? I didn't throw that in this question, but that's fair game for your test. So make sure you know that step-by-step -step sequence there, right? And then, so it's not MHC class one. Remember we said MHC class one is for what? Viruses, right? And endogenous antigens. So remember she talked about endogenous versus exogenous antigens. Bacteria will fall under exogenous antigen. So that means it's gonna use MHC class two. So exogenous antigens that are outside the cell will use uh, MHC class two and C4 positive T cell, okay? And then MHC class one will use CD8 positive cells and they're gonna clear endogenous antigens, which would be a virus, for example, because they cannot replicate outside of a cell. They have to be inside a cell at that point. It's an endogenous antigen, okay? So MHC class one and CD8 positive T cell, that will be virus machinery MHC class one and CD4, they do not go together, so that's eliminated, right? MHC class two and CD8 do not go together either, right? So MHC class one and CD8 positive T cells. So your correct answer here was exogenous antigen, therefore I'm using MHC class two and CD4 positive T cells, okay? And then you use which pathway? <laughs> Which pathway are you going to use? Oh. Endogenous or exogenous? Exogenous. This is your MAC stuff. Exogenous, right? Because it's an exogenous antigen. Okay, I see. We need a refresher there. Okay, so you guys know what to study now. Um, which of the following B cells makes antibodies? Mmm, what a spread. I'm kind of surprised by that. I just talked about that, all right? Which cells make antibodies? Plasma cells, those are mature B cells. They're not pro B cells, they're not pre B cells, and they're not immature B cells, right? If you couldn't remember all of that, you should remember that pro B, pre B, immature B cells are in the bone marrow. A plasma cell, is in the spleen, because the immature B cell leaves the bone marrow, goes to the spleen to become mature, or will mature into a plasma cell. A plasma cell will have to encounter 
foreign antigen in a secondary lymphoid organ, such as spleen, lymph node, or malt, right? Um, a, a mature B cell, I should say. A mature B cell will leave the spleen and go scouting, browsing for antigen. Remember we said that, right? And it's only when that mature B cell becomes activated, it becomes the plasma cell. And the plasma cell makes antibodies. And we, we talked about the structure of that plasma cell. It's larger, has a lot more cytoplasm, and has rough, a lot of rough ER, because it's making a lot of proteins, which are your antibodies. Okay. So it's not any of the other options. All of those are in the, in the bone marrow, and they're more immature forms of that B cell. Okay, last question. Which of the following drugs would you use to treat GERD? This is a question from uh, Dr. De La Pena's quiz, right? I took it straight out of that <laughs> quiz, so you should know this question. Which is the correct answer? Wow, yeah, you guys blew that out of the water. Proteinix, right? I guess you didn't forget that one. Um, so yeah, don't ask me about the MOA. Does anybody know the MOA for this? Dr. Delapinia is not here, so I just figured that. Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, so this is it. So um, this should help you kind of figure out, well, where are you in the spectrum, right? Are you ready for next week or not? If you did well on this quiz, you're on your way there. If you didn't, if you bombed it, mm, you have some work to do, right? If you're somewhere in between, you have a little less work to do, right? Bottom line is, this was just a practice quiz for you to see where you are, right, and to know what you need to work on. That being said, now I can move on to the more fun stuff, right? So the first one is, let's look at lecture objectives for the very first lecture. So, easy question. What are the four categories of pathogens? Anybody from the middle here? <coughs> Can I call names? <laughs> Gina is like, no. <laughs> I'm not looking straight at Gina to ask him. Any volunteer? It says, list the major categories of pathogens that have the potential to cause disease. What are those four pathogens? Bacteria. Four classes of pathogens. Bacteria. Okay. Virus. Okay. Parasites. Viruses. That's it. Easy question. That's all I was wanting you to know here. Right, second, explain the barriers that exist to prevent the entry of foreign pathogens into host organisms. What are those barriers? Mechanical, physical, microbiological, and with each of those, you need to be able to know what the examples are. Because if I list any of them in a question, you should be able to know if it's mechanical, microbiological, or uh, chemical, okay? So what I'm doing is walking you through the objectives to make sure that you know what the correct answers are to these objectives, because questions are coming from the objectives. So whenever I do a review, this is really what I do, right? To make sure all the students are on the same page. Okay, three, describe the process of hematopoiesis, specifically the immune cell lineages and cell types that arise from HSCs. What are the two major lineages? Myeloid and lymphoid. Okay, what are your lymphoid cells? B cells, T cells, natural killer cells. Okay, what are your myeloid cells? Okay, red blood cells. What are the other ones that we say we don't care about? Red blood cells and plate what? We don't care about them, right? But we do care about the white blood cells. So what are the white blood cells? of the myeloid lineage. What are they? Neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, mast cells, monocytes that become macrophages, and dendritic cells. Very good. You guys are on a roll here, right? See, that's all I was looking for in that, right? Of course, you know, as we go along, you have to know what each of those cells are going to do. <laughs> Okay, describe the structure and function of the specialized structures of the immune system. Uh, and you see them here. Uh, the specialized structures are cells, tissues, organs, and the microenvironment. 
We already described what the cells are, right? We just listed them, so you know what they are. That will be all of the white blood cells, lymphoid and myeloid, and it excludes platelets and red blood cells, right? That's what number three is when we say what are the cells. Of course, you need to be able to categorize them uh, between agranulocytes and granulocytes, right? What did we say a granulocyte has in its cytoplasm? Granules, right? This is why it's called a granulocyte. Those guys have granules in their cytoplasm. Agranulocytes do not have granules in their cytoplasm, but they have phagosomes and lysosomes, which will give you an indication that most likely they will function as phagocytes. Okay. Tissues and organs, we already know. We've got primary, secondary, tertiary, lymphoid organs. You already know what your primary are, secondary are. We just talked about that in that quiz, right? And the microenvironment, we're talking about everything that's outside of the cells, right? So we're talking about the cytokines, the growth factors, the osteoblasts, the endothelial cells, the neurons, everybody that's in that milieu. Stromal cells that secrete cytokines or provide support, right? Okay, identify the structures that are present on immune cells that allow them to identify foreign pathogens. What are those structures that are present on immune cells? They are called, what do immune cells have on their surface that helps them to identify pathogens? Receptors. Receptors. So in an innate system, those receptors are called what? Very good. Which means what? Pattern recognition receptors. Pathogen is probably an old thing, but yeah. What do adaptive cells have on their surface? Receptors, what are those called? TLR is an example of PRR. <laughs> like huh? BCR and TCR. Yay. Don't worry, Asia, I got you. <laughs> Did you? Uh, no, I'm yeah, okay. <laughs> you guys are funny. Okay. Um, uh, so when I say structures that are present in immune cells that allow them to identify foreign pathogens, I'm referring to receptors, right? Those receptors can be extracellular or intracellular. But what else can identify pathogens in the adaptive system besides those receptors? Antibodies, right? Because we said antibodies are a soluble form of the receptors, so don't forget that. On the innate side, we've got PRRs, but we also have soluble proteins that are called what that can also identify pathogens. Start with starts with a C. Which proteins can also recognize or bind pathogens in the innate? Well, I should say innate and adaptive, really. Well, we talk about them most in the innate system. Those are complement proteins. So when you think about it, you're thinking about what can bind pathogens? How, do, how, how does the immune system recognize pathogens? Two ways, receptors and soluble proteins. On the innate side, the receptors are PRRs. Soluble proteins are complement proteins. On the adaptive side, BCR, TCR, and antibodies, okay? So you just gotta think about it. If I'm in the immune system, I'm trying to figure out if there's bacteria or virus, what am I gonna use to bind them? That's what this question is asking. Six, distinguish between innate and adaptive immune system based on the type of immune response they produce. This is really talking about those summary slides that I had given you that has a figure summary figure and then it also showed you um, characteristics of the innate response. For example, we said innate response is quick, okay? It's not as selective, in other words, it's very general. And we said that uh, it happens within zero to four hours, four hours to four days. You guys remember that stuff? On the adaptive side, we talk about it's very slow, it's very specific, 
higher in magnitude and it has memory cells. Okay? So those slides are the ones you want to focus on here. Last one. The thing is between primary and secondary immune response, there's a figure that I had shown you guys and explained. Please make sure you understand that figure. Distinguish between primary and secondary. We said the primary response is which response? What's the difference between the primary and the secondary immune response? The primary is the one that responds first, like yeah. the innate. Yeah. So primary response occurs first. That's the first time you come into contact with a for, with an antigen from a foreign pathogen. That's your first insult. Your immune system will mount an innate and adaptive response as part of the primary response. Secondary just means that it's happening later, six months later, a year later. So it's the same um, as you saying, someone uh, contracted uh, COVID-19, right? Let's say today. That's the primary response. They're going to mount an immune response that's innate and adaptive. Probably takes 21 days or it may take a month. I don't know, depending on the strength of your immune system. Then the person contracts COVID again a year later. That's a secondary immune response. Okay. And that person will mount an innate and adaptive response again. But hopefully their adaptive response will be stronger because they have memory cells that remember that pathogen. Okay, first one is done. Second one. If I can find it. Because my, as you can see, my screen, you know, needs some help. <laughs> uh, and this is supposed to help me find things quickly. Don't ask me how I do it, but yeah. Okay, number one. Be able to distinguish between first line and second line of defense by identifying components of each line of defense. What is your first line of defense? Your physical and chemical. So it's part of your innate system, right? What's your second line of defense? It's your, your innate cells, right? So your, this is your cellular response. Right? So your barriers are there to prevent entry of the foreign pathogen. So that's the first line of defense. If the barrier is breached, then the second line of defense are those cells that are hanging out there, the resident innate immune cells that are always just hanging out, waiting for something to happen. Their response is that secondary response. It also includes the induced response. So remember when we talked about the innate system, we said that there is an immediate and an induced response. That immediate response is the response that's produced by those innate cells that are just hanging out there. The induced response is the response that occurs when those resident cells can't clear the pathogen and then they call for help and backup by, by recruiting innate cells from the blood vessels to leave the blood vessels and go to the infection site. Okay. So that immediate and induced response is what we're calling our second line of defense because it's really our cellular innate response. So it involves the cells. So first line is physical chemical barriers. Second line is your cellular response by your innate immune cells, whether it's immediate or it's induced. Okay, number two. Describe the structure and function of physical and chemical barriers. This was just us going into detail so you see that these barriers are found along all of your tracts, right? We talk about GI tract, urogenital tract, all that good stuff. Three, distinguish between pumps, steps, PRRs, and explain their role in the innate immune response. We already talked about PRRs, right? Because you need the receptor to bind the pathogen. But what are these receptors binding to, right? And that's where your pumps and steps come in. So what are pumps? What are they called? What is the meaning of this acronym? What are the words that go with this acronym, PAMP? Mm -hmm. Pathogen Associated, Associated Molecular, molecular Patterns. That's it, right? In other words, we're just trying to say antigens from the pathogen. That's it, that's it. Big word, big phrase, to mean something very simple. 
That's what immunologists do, right? It's like we don't have anything else to do, so we just try to make big words for everything, right? So there are a lot of jargons in immunology. It's just a vocabulary that you have to learn. DAPs. These are damage associated molecular patterns. And what are those? Examples of DAPs would be what? Damage patterns. <coughs> Dead cells, like right? Pieces of dead cells. Okay. Like we talked about. Okay. Four. Know the innate immune proteins and their contributions to the innate immune response. I have listed those proteins there for you. Right? So you have to go back to the slides that talk about these proteins. Make sure you know what they are and know examples of them and know what they do. So antimicrobial proteins, they just kill. Chemokines are chemoattractants, so they help to recruit cells, help them to migrate, right? Cytokines, we already talked about them at length, right? And you've seen so many examples of how they function in the immune system, because they help with differentiation, proliferation, activation, all the good stuff, right? Complement. And uh, remember, we talked about these cytokines, your pro-inflammatory cytokines. Make sure you know what they are and how they function. And complement, okay, when we're talking about complement, we're really talking about proteins. Those serum proteins, there are about 50 of them. And the ones that we focus on are like C3, C5, right? Um, but there are pathways that initiate the activation of those proteins, and then they converge. At which step, do you remember? Those three pathways converge at which step? C3, right? So C3 is split or, you guys remember any of that stuff, the figures, right? I'm just seeing glaze from everybody, right? So that slide, make sure you, you know it very well, the three pathways. We see where they we see how they're activated. We see that they converge at the C three step, where C three is actually split into C three A, C three B. We need those molecules because they're the molecules that will help with the uh, effector function. Well, I should say they help to activate C five, which becomes split again, and C five is what will be the final step for the effector mechanisms that you see downstream of that. Uh, inflammation, sorry, is this a new one? No. Identify the cells of the innate immune system and know their effector responses. So this is where you have to know all of the cells of the innate immune system. And you guys already listed them off for me. For those of you who do not remember, just learn it this way. Your um, adaptive cells are B and T cells. Every other cell is an innate immune cell, okay? All the other cells you listed for me, they're all innate immune cells except the B and T cells. That's how you learn this, right? Instead of you trying to memorize each one. So for each of the cell type now, you have to know what are the key effector functions that they use to clear pathogen? How do they eliminate pathogen? And I've listed the cells here for you. The only cells you don't see listed here, but you should add, is because I didn't update this, this, this particular electro objective, but um, added to this should be eosinophils, basophils, and mast cells. So it's gonna come. I'm just letting you know it, it should have been added to this objective and I, I didn't get a chance to do that. But it, it's, um, it's in your notes, so I'm gonna hold you accountable for it. Um, so let me ask, for example, what do, how do neutrophils eliminate pathogen? Huh? Nets. Nets, right? Please add to that netosis. <laughs> netosis, right? It's pretty much like apoptosis, but we're just killing by forming nets, okay? How are these nets formed, by the way? Yes, so we're pretty much expelling nuclear content. So nuclear membrane becomes disintegrated, so contents of nucleus is expelled, and nucleus contains DNA and proteins, histone proteins, right? So all of those will come out, 
and then they will be um, used to trap, form a trap around the foreign pathogen. In the process, the neutrophil dies, right? What else do neutrophils do besides netosis? Such as ROS and RNS, right? So ROS is a reactive oxygen species, so neutrophils will secrete ROS such as hydrogen peroxide, hypochlorous acid being the most potent of them all, right? And then the active nitrogen species such as nitrogen dioxide, right? Um, okay, finally, so I just gave you an example. What else do neutrophils do? Phagocytosis, okay? So those are the three main effector functions that neutrophils will undergo. So just like I just did this for neutrophils, you have to go through and look for each cell type. What are the things that I say that they do, those cells do, in order to clear pathogens? What are their effective functions? So macrophages, dendritic cells, we know that they also undergo phagocytosis, so you just gotta figure out what else do they do. Yeah. Be able to define inflammation. Describe the characteristics of the inflammatory response and describe the mechanism of inflammation. What are the characteristics of inflammation? Redness, swelling. Redness, swelling, pain, pain and heat, right? And then, of course, there's a mechanism that I had on the slide. What happens first, second, third? What causes the swelling? What causes the pain? What causes the redness? So make sure you know those things. Two down, let's see, one more to go? Well, several more to go, but yes, what's your question? reasons why we're doing this. We're talking about the immune system, what's happening normally. Because when we start to talk about the pathologies, like autoimmunity or other uh, situations where they'll put the patient on immunosuppressants, the major side effect of that is the patient now is exposed to bacterial, viral, or infections, and they can't clear them well. So that's a major side effect. And then what the pharmacist and the physician has to decide is, what are the pros and cons here, risks versus benefits, right? It's not that there are no side effects at all, it's just that they have to decide, do they want this patient's autoimmunity to go full blown and they lose their organs? Or are they gonna just give them immunosuppressant and they just get some side effects of bacterial infection? At that point, of course, as pharmacists, you have to decide, well, do we add antibiotics to help them manage that? This is the reason why, in the Crohn's disease patient, when you guys went through the treatment regimen, notice the regimen. So first, they had used antibiotics to help clear the pathogen, but then they'd also put them on, on corticosteroids, which are immunosuppressants. They're actually the worst kind. You don't want to keep your patient on that for long. But those are immunosuppressants. They don't want them to stay on it forever. You put them on immunosuppressant to kind of reduce the inflammation as quickly as possible, but you have to have a targeted therapy that that patient is gonna have in combination with that. And then ultimately, you want to wean the patient off of the immunosuppressant and give them a targeted therapy, such as an anti-L6 or an anti-L1 or some kind of therapy that is actually targeting the immune mechanism, right? Because you don't want to keep them, people just use immunosuppressants to reduce inflammation very quickly. So it's very broad spectrum, but ultimately you, you want to put that patient on something that's more targeted, right? That's more specific for whatever the mechanism of the disease is. Because otherwise, that's the problem you have. And even when you give patients like anti-L1 or L6 infections, and you'll see, we'll talk about that in FBMS 
five, I used to give a lecture on uh, what is called DMARTs, which are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which are used to treat uh, autoimmunity. Uh, it used to be in the FBMS series that Dr. Boyle, well, actually in MedChem and Pharmacology before we switched to FBMS series. Now, there's not enough time <laughs> to cover DMARTs. Um, and so I try to, I still give students the, the lecture, but they're not tested on it. But I'm working on including DMARTs in FBMS4, where I'm talking about autoimmunity, where I'll be talking about autoimmunity. But that's the reason why, because it's a very important thing for you to understand. If you understand immunology right here, and you understand what's happening when you put someone in an immunosuppressant, if you know what the normal immune response is supposed to be when there's a foreign pathogen, if you put a patient on an immunosuppressant, that patient can no longer combat effectively foreign pathogens. So it will always be a side effect. So anytime you come across any drug as an immunosuppressant, that should be the first thing you're thinking about. So thank you for bringing that up. It's a major teaching point so that you as students remember Anytime your patient is diagnosed with an immunosuppressant, you have to think about major side effect will be infections. That's just the reality. It's not, you can't avoid it. You know, you just gotta decide, is this what I wanna do for my patient or not, based on what they're dealing with, right? So the idea would be not to keep them too long on that, if you can avoid it. Good question, I like that. You know, that's, that's why we're doing this, right? Oh, you have another one, okay, go ahead. You're in a roll. So one of the reasons why they may end up putting someone on a anti-inflammatory is COVID has been shown to cause cytokine storm. You guys have heard of cytokine storm? It's really just an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokine. And it's so strong that it actually leads to ALS, <coughs> acute lung ALI, I should say, acute lung injury, right? which actually damages their lungs permanently. So to provide organ damage, a lot of times what they'll do is, yeah, they give you the vaccine, which is a preventative thing, but if you already have COVID and you haven't taken the vaccine, or even if you had the vaccine, you got COVID, bottom line is that means your body is now having to fight that infection. And what it means is that, depending on the strength of your immune system or what's going on, comorbidities, whatever, we just know, based on the data, uh, that one of the things they did is when they screened patients who had COVID, this is like 2020, 2021, a lot of studies came out showing that patients who had COVID, their serum levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines were significantly increased. They also saw increase in chemokines so if you think about what chemokines do, and you think about what pro-inflammatory cytokines do, that tells you that you're gonna have increased inflammation. And that increased inflammation can lead to, if it's uncontrolled, can lead to organ damage. So that's why they'll put them on an anti-inflammatory. It shouldn't be permanently, but they should, you know, just to help to reduce the storm, because the storm is what causes the damage. Because you want to have an increase in inflammatory cytokines, and et cetera, to clear pathogen, but you don't want it to be too much too fast. Because everything has to be done in balance, right? So uh, that's another good question. But that's, that would be a rationale for why they would put them on an anti-inflammatory, even though you want the immune system to be fighting the virus. But the thing is that it just goes out of control. And that's how patients tend to lose their organ function. And there's a short window because it happens so quickly. And that's what they found led to the death of many people. This is something I actually cover in class when I teach the med students, when I talk about cytokines. Because I, I used to give a cytokine lecture here when I had the immunology course. Because the immunology course was a course by itself and it was covered over block C and D. And I was able to take time and do all this beautiful stuff. 
But now that it's FBM S4, we don't have enough time, so I have to condense everything down to four uh, weeks, and so four to five weeks. And so the bottom line is, I don't get to talk about cytokines by itself. Because I talk about cytokines, what they are, what they do, what are some diseases when you have dysregulated cytokines, and then how do you treat that? And cytokine storm is a major example I cover um, with that. And that was seen, and is still being seen, in COVID patients. That's a major pathology. Major mechanism of COVID is, is cytokine storm. Okay, good questions, guys. Nice, okay. This one is the B cell one, right? Um, so this is pretty long, but I think we can run through it. Key characteristics of adaptive response, we already listed them, right? So magn increased magnitude, memory, et cetera. Two, distinguish between humoral and cell mediated. What's the difference between the two? Huh? Humoral immunity versus cell mediated immunity. What's the difference between the two? Humoral B cells. Humoral and, uh, immunity is mediated by antibodies, which are made by B cells. B cells. Okay. Cell mediated would be T cell stuff, cytotoxic, helper T cell, everything we just talked about, right? Summarize the process of antigen presentation, including different types of MHC molecules and the cells that express them. We just did that. MHC1, 2, CD4, CD8, we just talked about all that stuff, right? So that's what I'm expecting you to be able to know here. Four, highlight the stages of B cell development and where they occur. We, we just did that in that <laughs> question, right? Everything happens in the bone marrow ex, except the maturation of the B cell, so the immature B cell leaves bone marrow goes to spleen, completes it there. Um, when I say include early and late stages of B cell development, I'm talking about um, additional steps, right? So in the early stages of B cell development that happen in the, in the bone marrow, what are the key events that occur there? What are the key processes? Like, what does the B cell have to do in order for it to become immature? has to undergo negative selection, but pr prior to negative selection, yes, it's making the BCR, right? So it's gonna undergo VDJ recombination. Uh, so it's gonna undergo heavy chain gene rearrangement, and it's gonna undergo light chain gene re rearrangement to make the complete BCR, right? That's what's happening in early stages of development. Then in late stages of development, we're having negative selection, which occurs outside of the bone marrow. Um, and then it says, explain the steps involved in the development of the BCR, which we just kind of said, VDJ recombination, um, or V to J, uh, joining for light chain. Um, explain, uh, include gene rearrangements and checkpoints. What did we say about the checkpoints? There are two checkpoints, right? Now what are those checkpoints? Checkpoint one occurs when? So there are two major events. We're rearranging heavy chain to make heavy chain proteins. Then we're gonna rearrange light chain gene to make light chains of the BCR, right? So checkpoints occur after each of those steps. So first checkpoint will be after heavy chain rearrangement. Heavy chain gene rearrangement. Because we're checking to see, are those, have those cells successfully rearranged heavy chain? If they have, then they go on to rearrange light chain. If they have not, then they undergo apoptosis. So that's what we mean by checkpoint. When we're thinking checkpoint, you're thinking, at which point are cells undergoing apoptosis or they're being selected because they've successfully completed the process. Checkpoint number two occurs after light chain, okay? After light chain rearrangement. Because again, you're checking to see which cells successfully uh, completed light chain rearrangement and which have not, right? Okay. Uh, compare and contrast negative selection and, negative, uh, and positive selection in the B cell, right? So you have to think about what happens during negative selection? What happens during positive selection? So for a B cell, what's happening during negative selection? So, 
Yeah. So what's happening to the cells when they bind? So in negative selection, we're looking at B cells that can bind self-antigen. If they can, what happens to them? They die, right? Positive selection are those B cells that did not bind self-antigen, and they're moving on to receive BAF signal, right, to then undergo survival, right? So they're going to grow or proliferate. Um, so that would be positive selection. Know the main functions of a mature B cell. I had a slide that talked about what the B cell does. It's really to make antibodies, all that good stuff. Um, summarize the process of B cell activation. To do so, you have to include T-dependent versus T-independent B, B cell activation. So you just need to know what the steps are for that, right? Um, anybody can remember? We already talked about the three major signals for B cell to become activated. You have to know what those signals are. And then you have to know that the B cell can, can have those three signals, but it can get help from a T cell or it can become activated outside of the T cell. Okay. Anybody can remember what happens outside of the T cell, the T independent mechanisms? What does the B cell use? <coughs> Anybody can remember? You can feel free to go to that slide. The CD4 T <laughs> cells? Huh? Does it use the CD4 T cells? CD40? Four. No, CD4. CD4? Uh -huh. T, I'm asking about T independent. Oh, so T the, the B cell activation that doesn't need T cells at all. What, what are the ways that the B cell can become activated without the help of the T cells? So CD4 is, is, is an example of T dependent activation of, of B cells. In other words, the B cell needs the T cell to help it become activated. So that would be an example of that. But now I'm asking what are examples of how does that B cell become activated without the T cell? How does it do that? Use TLR, right? So like receptor, you know, which is a pattern uh, recognition receptor, right? Okay, CD40, uh, CD40 ligand uh, interaction, right? What about the other methods? So that's all describing the TLR method, right? So it needs TLR with these other things. So what's another way to uh, activate the B, the B cell without T cells? C D C three, right? Complement, right? And C D twenty one uh complex. So yeah. It's getting hazy now, but hey, these are like you know, fair game guys. Um, okay, outline the different fates of B cell following T dependent activation. Now this is what's happening downstream of the activation, right? We just talked about signals required to activate it. Now we're talking about after it's activated, what happens? What are some of the different things the B cell can do post-activation? It can do what? It can, I'm sorry? Yeah. So yeah, so it can it can become a memory cell. It can it can uh, make antibodies, right? Low affinity antibodies to go and find pathogen, and then antibodies will perform all the different functions. It can form a memory cell. What else can it do? It can go through go. It can undergo SH SHM, which is somatic hypermutation, right? To increase affinity for antigen, and it can also do one other thing, what's that? It can class switch, right? It can undergo class switch recombination to make other classes of antibodies. Because remember when we said the first type of antibody that we made is IgM, IgD, so to make all the others, you need to undergo class switch recombination, right? Um, Okay, then compare structure of the uh, B cell receptor and 
an antibody. So a BCR versus a soluble receptor versus the antibody. What are the structural differences? I have slides on those, right? And remember we said mRNA splicing is the mechanism that's really involved there. FC receptors, what are those guys? They are formed on what? In immune cells. Not adaptive cells, but FC receptors bind to antibodies. So FC receptors are found on cells and they bind antibodies. So the antibody can bind two sets of things. Antibodies can use their variable region on the top to bind antigen, or they can use their FC region on the bottom to bind FC receptors on other cells. So antibodies can bind in both directions. Know the five classes of the antibodies, all five of them, and then what do they do? What are their general functions? Okay, so in the last, oh, one thing I need to tell you is I will put up um, a lecture objectives for the MHC lecture. Okay, remember Dr. Hughes gave a lecture? Mm -hmm. So I created lecture objectives for those, and I will post those um, in, in that folder to help you, but in there is really just class one, class two, endogenous, exogenous, the pathways um, and all that stuff, okay? So I will post this lecture objective today for you. Um, we already went over a lot of that stuff, so I'm not gonna stay there. The last one here is this uh, T-cell lecture objective, and again, because we just did it, I'm not gonna spend, spend a lot of time here, but when we talk about outline the stages of T-cell development in the thymus, I wanted you to talk about what are the key stages occurring. So what are the stages of development, which would be your DN1, 2, 3, 4, SP, sorry, DP, SP, also negative positive selection. That's what I'm talking about here, okay? When we talk about number two, we're talking about the genes that are rearranged to make TCR. So you have to know the names of all those genes and which ones are being rearranged to make what? Right? So which genes are rearranged to make alpha chain, beta chain, gamma chain, delta chain, okay, of the receptors? Um, then you have to know the structure of the TCR and distinguish between the two classes of TCRs. What I'm talking about here is, remember we said there are two types of TCRs that are usually made. What are those two types called? Anybody remembers? So TCR is a T-cell is a receptor that's found on a T-cell. Now we said there are two types of TCRs that are made. Anybody remember? It's your alpha beta TCR and your gamma delta TCR. So make sure you know that guys, know the difference. Um, then you have to know what is negative and positive selection, what's occurring at those stages. We talked about that in class today, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time there. Um, explain the fate of T-cells with the TCR, right? That can uh, bind varying affinity of self, uh, MHC and peptide. This is that slide, second slide we talked about today. Okay, lecture objective number five is that slide that talks about low affinity versus intermediate affinity versus high affinity versus very high affinity, that slide, okay? Number six, distinguish between the main effector T cell subsets. So CD4 versus CD8, what do they do? What are their names? And then what do they do? What is their function, okay? And then how do they become activated? Well, that's what I mean by their method of activation, okay? Where we talk about signal one, two, three for the cytotoxic T cell and the helper T cell. And then we talked about for the cytotoxic T cell, you have sequential versus simultaneous activation. Then we also talk about for cytotoxic T cell, the mechanism of how they kill, right? With the granules being released on the target cell, okay? Last question, TILS versus CAR T cells, know what those, what those do, how they, how they work, which I did explain as, as the major application, clinical application of T cells. Any questions, guys? This brings us to the end of the, uh, review session. Any questions for me? So I owe you lecture objectives and instructions for the exam next week.
So you'll see that coming up shortly. Um, and then, agamoglobulinemia questions will be on the mental so your, your, your final, just kind of know, typically for midterm and final, I tend to put multiple choice um, questions and essay questions on there. So be prepared. Right? All my exams, they will have essay questions because you guys need to know to write well. Right? And I hear crickets at this point. You guys don't like to write? Why? Why? <laughs> just kidding. Anyway, all the best next week. Because um, I won't see you until next Thursday. So, you know, study hard. You'll do just fine. Um, keep up the good work. Shoot me emails if you have any.